And everybody said, Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name for your people. Thank you for our leaders, our brothers and sisters. Thank you because you have raised us up so that we can do something excellent to the glory of your name. And I pray that you bless your work in our hands in Jesus' name. Physically, bless the work. Spiritually, bless the work. Church buildings, bless the work. Use children, women, men, campus, everybody. I pray, Lord, you use all of us to raise up your work and that at the end, none of us will miss a reward in Jesus' name. Bless your people today. Open our eyes of understanding that we may behold important, deep things in your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight we come to something very serious and something very important. I want you to hold uh, one verse of scripture in your mind, in your heart. Underline it in your Bible. In 1 Kings chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 11. 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 11. And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, Let not him that guardeth on his earnest boast himself as he that putteth it off. Let him not that guardeth on his earnest, that is his armor, the one that is just getting ready to fight. Get ready to go to the battlefield. Let him not boast as the one who's already finished and is put off his armor or his earnest. That is, those of us who are living today and now you are studying this. And you look at that man that fell, at the man that eventually got into his final age. While you're still awake, that's the time to take some decisions. While you're still happy in the Lord, standing in the Lord, abiding in the Lord, that's the time to take some decisions. When you're still courageous and bold, and you still have your mind and your senses, no depression, no distress, no discouragement, and you love the Lord, that's the time to take some decisions. And then to renew that decision day by day and say, that's the stand I have taken. That's the direction I'm going and I will never look back. You see, if you don't do that, who knows? A time of distress may come. And you have not really made a decision to make up your mind and to say, this is what I will never do, come what me. It's at a time you are healthy and happy and righteous and holy and almost in the moon. Almost, you know, saying whatever happens, this is what I'm going to do. That's the time to take the best of decisions in your life. So that when times come, that sickness knocks at the door. When times come, that there's so much pain, that you don't know what am I going to do. And then the people around you, your relatives, might want to decide for you. Or your wife might want to decide for you. Or your husband might want to decide for you. And the decisions they're taking or they're going to take will be based on their sympathy. Will be based on, hey, our relative is suffering. Cousin is suffering. Uncle is suffering. And we need to do this for him. And they might carry you somewhere. That that place they carry you to if you end your life there, will not be sure of a blessed eternity for you. At that time, when to say no will be a real ordeal. That's the time. That's not the time you are going to take your decision. Today, while we're studying this passage, today, while you still say, praise the Lord, I'm strong, I'm healthy. That's the time to take that decision. And I pray God will give us wisdom in Jesus' name. 
I'm going to look at this important message tonight the end and the future. The end and the future. And normally, when you see the end, you don't think there's another future after the end. The end is the terminal point, the end is the end of all things. But no, the end and the future of a self destroyed life. The end, earthly end, the future, the eternal future of a self destroyed life. If you know anything about Saul, he was a man of self-management. A man that will say, I do this, I do that. And it's so very dangerous when somebody has that kind of attitude and that kind of lifestyle. Self is sitting on the throne. His feeling is the most important thing. And uh, his pleasure is the most important thing. And uh, his ease of peace is the most important thing. Self sits on the throne. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, 1 Samuel chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 12. Therefore said I, that's the word I, the Philistines will come down now. He gazed upon me to Gilgal, and I, that's the word I, I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a bunch offering. I forced myself. I didn't think of the word of God at that time. I didn't think of the ministry of the priest being different from the ministry of the king at that time. I didn't think of the requirement of the Lord. I didn't think of what Samuel the prophet had said. I didn't think of our agreement. All I thought about was myself. I forced myself, therefore, a self-destroyed life. We're looking at chapter 15. For Samuel, we're looking at chapter 15, and here we look at verse 24. Look at verse 24 here in chapter 15, First Samuel. And then it, it tells us now again, this is him. And uh, Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee. Verse 26, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. Let's go to verse 24 now. In verse 24, and Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy word, because, tell me, I feared the people. I feared the people. He was not a man with a backbone. He was not a man with conviction. He was not a man that said, this is wrong. Whatever happens, whoever supports, whoever opposes, this I cannot do. It's wrong. Because the fear of man brings a snare upon your life. But the man said, a king, the one who should be in authority. Look at what he said. I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. See, that's the man that wants to destroy himself. He does not have the fear of God as the uppermost thing in his heart, in his life. He is like a puppet. You tie a rope on his leg and you can, you know, dangle him here and there because it's not stable. Let's come to chapter 28. In chapter 28 of 1 Samuel, we're looking at verse 3. In verse 3, latter part, second part of verse 3, and Saul. I put away those 
that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. He had put away the people that had familiar spirit, the men that had familiar spirit, the women that had familiar spirit, the shrines where evil spirit, familiar spirit is honored and worshipped, the temples of familiar spirit, he had destroyed them at the beginning of his reign. But now, he got into a problem. That's what I'm telling you. At that time, when you have the conviction to destroy evil, to destroy all the shrines and all the temples of evil and darkness, at that time, take an irreversible decision and tell yourself, whatever happens in life, this sin that I've destroyed, I'll never raise it up again. At that time, when you feared nobody, and you didn't fear the witches or the wizards or the familiar spirits or their shrine or any power of darkness, at that time when you're strong, it's the time to take the decision, I destroy this, and I stand here. I make up my mind, I'll never go back on that anymore. Because a time of confusion may come. A time of weakness may come. A time of distress may come. But then you will remember, you say, that's the decision I made. I'm going to stand by that. Let me tell you another thing. Be careful of the people you surround yourself with. Let's come to verse 7 here. In verse 7, Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. The people you surround yourself with, they should be people who are ignorant of evil. They should be people who do not know where to find what you're looking for at the time of your temptation, at the time of your trial, at the time when you are bending and shaking. And then you're saying, what am I going to do now? I need to find a woman that has a familiar spirit. That is the time the people around you must be ignorant people. And then when he told them, seek me, woman, they should have said, we destroyed everything. You destroyed everything. Everyone that has familiar spirit. And we don't know where they are. But when the people who surround you, they're the people that know where the witches are. The people who surround you, they're the people who know where the evil things are and the evil worshippers are. And anytime if you get into temptation and you say, I'm looking for this, look at verse 7, their second part of verse 7. And his servants said unto him, he told them to go and look. They said, we don't need to look, we know where they are. Go and seek for them. We don't need to seek for them. We know where they are. And so his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that has a familiar spirit at Endor. They knew the spot. And so you want to be very careful. The people you surround yourself with, the people who know when you are having temptation and you are seeing, the people who will cover you up. The people who will disguise. The people, they are your servants. All they want to say is yes to you. Anything you want, they just say yes. And they cannot confront you and say, sir, that's not right. You are the king in Israel. And what kind of position is that? They cannot confront you and say, madam, how can that be? How can you do that? And you so have their heart, you so have their mind, that whatever you want, even if it will drag you to hell, they will support you and they will go along with you. You don't want to support yourself with such workers and such servants and such maids and such people that if you have any temptation, they lend you, they give you a helping hand to commit that sin. But you see this man, they saw at a time when he became 
so depressed, so discouraged. And he saw that he was seeking for God and um, God would not answer him. He said, well, I have an alternative. And eventually he did what he did. Let's look at this in First Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 13. First Chronicles chapter 10, I'm reading here from verse 13. It says in verse 13, so Saul died. You know, eventually everybody will die before the rapture. Eventually, the righteous will die before the rapture. Eventually, the backslider will die before the rapture. Think of that final end. And then think of the future that follows after that. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of each. He didn't actually get any benefit from inquiring after the witch of Endor. What benefit did he get? He didn't get anything positive. Only to be told, you will die. Only to be told, tomorrow, Israel will fall to the hands of the enemy. And that wasn't any positive message. What did he get out of that? If he had spent the time repenting, if he had spent the time seeking the face of the Lord, if he had spent the time looking for the way out to still make reconnection with the Lord, how wonderful that would have been. Well, he is gone, but we are here. Well, we'll take care of our lives and take it so that we don't fall into the same thing he fell into in Jesus' name. Somebody there will say amen. amen. Look at first Samuel chapter 31. First Samuel chapter 31. And we're reading from verse 4. First Samuel chapter 31 verse 4. It says, Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through. Draw thy sword and thrust me through. Listen to this. Therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through. He said, it will be a shame if the Philistines will come and thrust me through and I die. And then people will say that it was uh, the uncircumcised that killed him. And he said, to avoid that shame, please kill me. You know what they call that today? They call that mercy killing. So that I will not continue to suffer, kill me. So that I will not come to shame, kill me. So that that thing that we're trying to cover up now is coming out and the world will see ah, look at the man look at the dead she life and look at uh, the miserable life she lived and so they plead with others they don't want to think of suicide force they want mercy killing somebody is sick to the point that you know they don't believe in miracles anymore and they don't believe that anything will change and so they will say if you can put your you know hand on paper and sign they call it mercy killing that's what he wanted you see as we go through this world a lot of things will happen but if you are taking your decision long long ago before that sickness came and before that attack came, before that affliction came, all these things that the world is getting into now, you will not get there in Jesus' name. And then it says, but his armor bearer would not, for he was so afraid. Therefore, tell me, read it out loud. Saul took his sword 
himself and fell upon it. What do you call that? Tell me. Suicide, suicide, suicide. Self-destruction. And you will see from the beginning of his life, watch your life. And watch the tendency of your life The tendency of your life To take your life into your own hands And the tendency of your life To live an independent life And to always say Anytime you want to get into trouble You always do something to get out of that trouble Always Every time there's going to be a confrontation With whatever you've done You always do something to get out of it Self-management And nothing followed him until the point of death That when he saw the Philistines and they were circumcised He said, no, these ones will not kill me Therefore, I'm a bearer, help me Help me out here and thrust your sword through me So that you're an Israelite It will be an Israelite that killed me And that one said, I'm not going to do that And then when he saw that he'll not do that He said, okay, I'll do it myself A self-destructive lie that the man just, you know, forgot about the commandments of the Lord and then died. I pray you will not die like this. But you know, the secret of dying like a righteous man is to make up your mind that at this time when I'm healed and hearty, at this time when I'm sound and healthy, at this time when I love the Lord and love the Bible, at this time when my brain is still functioning, at this time when I have conviction and I want to live by that conviction, I draw the line. I make up my mind. I make some conclusions, a conclusions that have support and backbone so that in the days of distress, in the days of discouragement, in the days of disease, in the days of defeat, you remember the decisions you made, you will stand in Jesus' name. The end and the future of a self-destroyed man. Three points. Number one is compromise in disobeying God. Is compromise in disobeying God. Number two. The condemnation for defying God. The condemnation for defying God. Number three, the consequence of dying without God. The consequence of dying godless, graceless, without God. The consequence of dying without God. Point number one is compromise in disobeying God. Let's come to First Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15. Let's see what Samuel told him in verse 17. First Samuel chapter 15 verse 17. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. When you were small in thy sight, when you were humble, when you were little in thy sight, when you were lowly, when you were nobody in your own sight, and you were grateful at that time, for every sin and every offer the Lord gave you, the Lord made you king over his people, Israel. For Samuel chapter 10. We're reading from verse 9. For Samuel chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned the soul, his back to go from Samuel. God gave him, tell me, another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. The man was converted. The man had another heart. The man had a change of heart. If he had continued like that, what wonder he would have been. Let's look at verse 20. In verse 20, 
And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, and the tribes of Benjamin was taken, and when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken, and when they sought him, tell me, they could not be found. Samuel had told him earlier, all the eyes of the children of Israel are upon you. And he said, who am I that I shall be king over Israel? And when everybody now came together, he knew the time of the appointment of the king had come. He went to hide himself. That's what the humility of this man at the beginning. You look at your life now, now that you are saved, now that you are sanctified, now that you are holy and humble, that's the time to take a decision that you will follow the Lord and you will not change. But you see, if you don't take some important decisions now, when you're still alive in the Lord, and when you're still strong in your conviction, when you're still humble, if you don't take that decision now and then say, I'm going to live by this, we don't know what's going to be in the future. We're looking at verse 22. Therefore, the quiet of the Lord, Father, if the man should yet come thither, and the Lord answered, Behold, he has, what's the word? He hid himself among the stall. And it says in verse 23, And they ran, and they fetched him thence. That's how he became king. The man was humble. He started well. He did not continue well. I pray you will continue well. What could he have done to have continued well? After he was chosen, after he became a king, Deuteronomy chapter 17, Deuteronomy chapter 17, we're reading from verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 17, reading from verse 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me. You hear that? The Lord was looking forward to the time, and he knew the time will come. He said, when you get to that land, the time will come when you will say, I will set a king over me. And then he says, like as all the nations that are about me. That's exactly what happened. But look at this. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. That's exactly what happened. God chose Saul. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not of thy brethren. But he shall not multiply horses to himself. You see that? Nor cause the people to return to Egypt. You see that? To the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the Lord has said unto you ye shall henceforth return no more that way and then it goes on and on look at verse 16 and it shall be when he seated upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall tell me that he shall tell me out loud, write him what? A copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him. The word of God shall be with him. The totality of the word that he had until that time shall be with him. How long? And he shall reach therein, tell me, 
all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes and to do them that's what he should have done he immediately got to the throne a humble man a converted man a meek and lowly man a man with a change of heart and a change of life he should have gone to take the word of god from the standing priest at that time from somewhere and then copy with his own hand there was no preaching at that time and then after copying everything that should be his priority what should be your priority now that you're born again now that you are saved and sanctified filled with the holy ghost now that you're a leader a leader over the people of god to take the word of god and read it every day and learn from it every day and then live your life according to the word every day so that when any time of challenge any time of difficulty any time of conflict any time of battle any time comes to your life you will remember the word you're reading every day you'll still be able to stand on the word but the one that becomes a leader becomes a king becomes a ruler becomes a pastor becomes an overseer and there's no quiet time and there's too much of activity and we cannot get back to the world again that's what happened to Saul I pray it will not happen to you yeah. give me a good amen yeah. we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 13 what happened to him now the compromise that came to his life do you make allowances in your life today which you never made when you were young convert allowances for yourself things you do and things you say and places you go and things you touch and things you look at that you couldn't do at a time you were new convert at a time when you were soaking in the word of god believing the word of god but now there are liberties now you do some things you wouldn't have done at that time watch out watch out that's how it started with Saul in first Samuel chapter 13 and I'm reading from verse 11 first Samuel chapter 13 verse 11 and Samuel said what hast thou done tell me what hast thou done and Saul said because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash was walking by sight they gathered themselves together and because they gathered themselves together and I thought something must be done therefore said I the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal and I have not made supplication unto the Lord I forced myself therefore what are you looking at are you looking at the glory of God are you looking at your own upliftment what are you looking at are you looking at obedience to the word of God or you're looking at your own kind of apprehension what are you looking at are you looking at the fact that here is the word of the Lord and Samuel was the one that appointed you and he is the leader and he said he's coming are you waiting for Samuel or are you going to take loss into your hand you know there are people that do that you wouldn't do that when you are young convert when you are humble and lowly and when you are literally in your own sight he said because of this I forced myself and Samuel said to Saul thou hast done foolishly you took loss into your hand thou hast done foolishly you forced yourself I, I was just apprehensive and I thought something has to be done right now therefore I had to just I, I didn't want to do it I knew this was wrong I knew this was not the way to go I knew this was not the right thing but because of this compulsion I had within something must be done something must be done something must be done I forced 
myself therefore you've done foolishly that was not kept the commandment of the lord thy god which he commanded thee for now would the lord have established thy kingdom upon israel how long he missed it his posterity missed it now it will have been forever but now thy kingdom shall not continue the lord has sought him a man after his own heart and the lord has commanded him to be captain over his people because thou was not kept that which the lord commanded thee we're looking at chapter 15 chapter 15 of first samuel a self-destroyed man he destroyed himself I forced myself. He destroyed his own chances. He destroyed his own royalty. He destroyed his own opportunity. I forced myself. Are you living in a way that you don't make any reference to God anymore? What does God want? What has God commanded? What is written in the word? What's my commitment to the Lord? Is God the center and the point of reference in your life? Or is it my ease, my pleasure, my upliftment, my exaltation, my position? What is it now in your life? So that I will not be ashamed. So that I will not come to, you know, a kind of great disrespect before the people. And so that you still look up to me, you're trying to protect yourself. God is no more the point of reference. That's dangerous. And that's what made this man to collapse and to fall and to compromise. I pray it will not happen to you. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, I'm reading here from verse 19. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're reading from verse 19. Wherefore then? Didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, and didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, you see that? A king? He was not in control of the people. The people were in control of him. Are you like that? You're a leader. God is not in control of your life anymore. You fear the people in your local church, in your local government, in your region, in your state, in your nation. Mother, you fear God. Instead of considering what does God say, what does God expect, what has God commissioned me to do, the fear of the people is what's uppermost in the heart. That's what happened to Saul. That's why he just did this and that without making God or the word of God the point of reference. It can come to that situation in the church where, you know, this is the right thing to do. That's what God wants. This is what to preach. That's what God wants. But if I preach this, what will the people, wherever the people are, what will they think? How will they accept this? How will they receive this? How will they view this? The style of your life, the style of your leadership, that God is no more the point of reference in the life of this man is the people. Verse 21, but the people took of the good, the sheep and the oxen, and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. I knew that, but the people didn't want to do that. And then it's to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal rationalization 
Then he goes on and Samuel said, As the Lord shall great delight in bond offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is at the scene of, tell me, that's where he ended, that's where he ended, that's where he ended. Disobedience, rebellion, is at the scene of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, oh, this is too late. Why did you say that at the beginning? What do I have to force you to accept your sin? Why do you have to, you know, we take him away from there and we tell him that you are rejected. You are no more a king because God has seen that you are rebellious and then I have seen. Why do you want to wait for that? When the discipline comes and eventually you see that the leadership is not bulging and we say this is wrong. And you cannot continue. And then when you, you try to test our sincerity, you try to test our seriousness, you try to test our conviction, you try to test whether we can stand or not, you try to test whether we'll fear you or will not fear you. And when you see that we take, we maintain our ground, that this is going to come on you. We're going to remove that kingship and royalty and leadership away from you. Uh -huh. Eventually, I have seen. That's not the way of the people who want to get to heaven. The people who want to get to heaven, they say, I know this is wrong. And if you're if you mistakenly found in that, immediately you turn around and then you straighten out your life. But well, this man look at him in verse 24. And so said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Now he's telling us the truth. I I, it's not the people, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I, tell me, tell me out loud, I feared the people. You know, the fear of the people can land you in hell fire. But understand, understand, when you were born into this world, none of the people here, none of the people you fear today, did you know? You didn't know anybody then. When well, you were born again and you came into the kingdom, none of the people you say you fear now, and you cannot stand, you cannot take a stand and say, here is the thing to do. None of the people that you fear now, none of them did you know. It's, look up at me here. Are you there? Some people are looking at say, look up at me here. Are you with me? When I got born again, I didn't know one single solitary one among all of you here. Among all the people that I meet today, when I got born again, 1964, 5th of April, I didn't know any of them. When I made up my mind and I consecrated my life, and I said, Lord, here is my life, and here is how I'm going to spend my life. I didn't know any of you, anybody that I know today. And when Deeper Life started, August 3, 1973, I didn't know any of you here. And now that Deeper Life has been, and I say, this is what I've read in the Bible. This is my conviction. Now I want to declare that conviction. I'm looking at somebody there. He's 20 years, 30 years younger than I am. And I'm afraid of him. He wasn't even born into this world when God led me to say, here is what to believe and here is how to live. And the person that was not born then, when I said, Lord, I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm going to get to that heaven. And I must not subtract. I must not add to the word of God. The person journey just come. That I just knew yesterday, a man, a woman, I knew just, uh, you know, pretty, just about a few years ago, a few months ago, is the one that will now say, uh-uh, you cannot stand by that conviction. 
I'll be foolish. I'll be like Saul. To fear the people that I didn't know at that time when I made up my mind and thank God I'm not going to be like Saul. Amen. Say it for yourself. You see the people, when you are not looking at God and you are not lifting up God and saying, I'm going to obey God for the rest of my life. We made our decisions when we were young, when we didn't have all these wagons around us, and that was the best time we would have made our decision. Now we can go back to that decision and say, praise the Lord, here is the decision I made at that time, and the fear of man will not kill you in Jesus' name. You know, since I started telling you a story, let me still tell you more. Deeper life started 1973, August. There was nobody that, you know, agreed with me or, you know, said, I'm going to agree with you, I'm going to do this. It was all solitary, an individual. And then we started the Bible study in Flatu, in Lagos at the university. The church I was going there, you many of you know, I was going to the apostolic faith. That's why I was born again. And the overseer called me and said, hey, he mentioned my name. He said, this is going to be tough and hard. I said, yes, I know. They don't do that in that church, evangelism. They don't do that. And then he said, we're going to take this stand against you. I said, yes, sir, I know. And then nobody supported me at that time. I didn't have any prayer partner that would say, keep on, we're praying with you. I didn't have any prayer warriors supporting me at that time. I said, this is where I stand. And then eventually they made a public announcement and then they sent that message all over their churches, all over Nigeria. Everywhere I went, the people that knew me, they said, are you so and so? Yes, I said, yes, I am. They said, what has happened? I said, what happened is this is what I believe and this is what the church believes and therefore they excommunicated me. That's the word. Now, you think of a man who bore all that, and I didn't know you at that time. Maybe you were there, but I didn't know you. And then I took that stand, and I suffered that, and I made up my mind, this is what you do. You think I will not look at your face, all that I've suffered for, all those many years, and then everything will go down the drain, God forbid. I will stand on the word of God. You like it, you don't like it, that's not my point. That's not my business. My sin is, this is the word of God, and I lift up that word of God, and I'm going to stand by that word of God, and I'm passing that on to you, you will stand. See, the people that do not have any backbone, they don't have any fire in their bones. Somebody they met yesterday will change their conviction. Somebody they met a few years ago will change their conviction. They cannot stand. I will keep on standing. Somebody there will keep on standing. You see, that's what Saul could not do. He feared the people. And because of fearing the people, he didn't, he didn't know all those people. When Samuel met him, no, he didn't know them. Why don't you understand that today, if God has called you into leadership, all the people you are trying to fear today, and then you don't fear God, who owns your life, who takes the final decision over your life, what are you going to be in eternity? That's what happened to this man, Saul. I pray it will not happen to you. Amen. Give me a good, good amen over there. Amen. And so eventually, said, because I feared the people, that's why I did what I did. And let's look at the consequence of that. We're looking at First Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 13. First Chronicles chapter 10. And we're reading the first part of verse 13. It says, so Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord. You see that? He committed that transgression against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. That was the compromise. He started well, he didn't finish well. Somebody there, you started well, but tell me out loud, you'll finish well in Jesus' name. But if that's going to be, the fear of man must come under your feet. The fear of women must come under your feet. 
the fear of society must come under your feet you must be able to say here is what i know in the watch of god and here is the prayer i have made here is the consecration i have made and i will stand by that god will help you to stand by that in jesus name we're coming to point number two is the condemnation for defying God. The condemnation for defying God. Look at the second part of verse 13 of the place we're reading. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13, the second part. Also, for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Asking counsel. A familiar spirit that's defying God because God had said that's what not to do. Leviticus, I'm reading from chapter 19. Leviticus, chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 31. Leviticus, chapter 19, we're reading from verse 31. It says in verse 31, Regard not them that are familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them i am the lord your god the commandment was clear and Saul understood that at the beginning that's why he destroyed all those people having familiar spirits at the beginning of his reign look at chapter 20 leviticus chapter 20 and we're looking at verse 6 leviticus chapter 20 and we're reading from verse 6 it says in verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a warring after them, I will even search my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Very clear, very clear. That if anybody consulted with familiar spirits, here is what the Lord was going to determine chapter 18. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 18, we're reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations there shall not be found among you any anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that you said divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or tell me a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits. The Lord told them. And this is what a soul should have copied. It should have written it down. It should be reading it every day and every time. And when it was still strong, when it was still having conviction, before the battle came with the uh, Philistines, it should have reminded himself, this is what I will never do. You see, when you remind yourself every time, and you say that every time, that you'll never go this way, when the time of challenge comes, when the time of persecution comes, and when the time of discouragement, difficulty comes, you will not go that way. It says, it goes on to say, or oh, a wizard or a necromancer, for all that do these things are what? An abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. You know what he's saying? He's saying that God does not even accept it for the pagans. The pagans that did that, God said, that's why I'm driving them out. I give them land to live on. They don't respect me. I give them land to farm on. They don't recognize me. And they do all these abominations. Because of that, I'm driving them out. What God does not even permit pagans to do. He doesn't permit those uh, heathens to do. He doesn't permit the sinners to do. Now to think of the king or the people of Israel doing that. What a terrible thing. It says in verse 13, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearkened unto the observers of times, and unto diviners, but as for thee, 
the Lord thy God has not suffered thee so to do. The Lord does not permit you to do that. And that means then, uh, sometimes uh, people get sick. And when they get sick, we pray. Of course, God answers prayer. But we don't know the last sickness somebody will have before you go to glory. And maybe we are prayed and, you know, for one reason or the other, you have not been healed. Then we pray again. Then we pray again. Then we pray again. And because Jesus said, may not always to pray and tell me, and not to faint. But before the prize and said, you know, sometimes uh, relatives will come. Sometimes, well, wishes will come. Sometimes uh, people uh, they, they, who have strayed away and they are still coming to the church physically, they will come and say, you know, uh, you know, if God is not answering our prayer here, we know where we can take you. What is that? Well, they use this and use that. Only the name of Jesus, uh-uh, they go beyond the name of Jesus. I don't know anything beyond the name of Jesus, do you know? I don't know anything higher than faith in Jesus, do you know? Nobody say they'll take you somewhere. And when they take you there, who knows, who knows, you'll get well. But uh, what if, uh, you know, I hear, uh, they hear that and uh, the church frowns at it. You're talking about church, we're talking about, you know, taking you somewhere. What if you die there? What if you lose your life there? What if you become like Saul? That they use all this magic and all this occultism and all these things on you and then you die right there. If you're a child of God, of course you take your stand. You say, I'm praying and I've done, you know, if you're doing medical things, things that are all right, things that are clean, things that are pure, that we know that this, there's no voodoo in this, there's no juju in this one, and there is no talisman here, there is, there is nothing here that's occultic, this is pure medicine, that we understand. But when it comes to, you know, you're going to another place and they'll pray for you there. You're going to another place, they sprinkle something upon you there. You're going to another place and they will consult for you. And they will tell you who is behind this. They will tell you the vision and the revelation. And then they will guide you as to this and that. You already get into occultism. That is the direction of Saul. I will not go there. I said I will not go there. Hey, listen to me. People who are younger than you, they have died and they have gone to heaven. What's your problem? You think about heaven. You don't want to get to heaven. You, you, you talk about heaven, you don't want to go to heaven, and then I might die. If you're a believer, if you die, where are you going to? You don't want to go there. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If you die before me, you're going to spend extra time before I meet you there. Don't, want you, don't you to, don't want to spend extra time in heaven? I don't want to die now. What are you doing here if you don't want to die? Of course, you want to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven. That means you want to die now. Why don't you want to die? Our problem, carry me there, carry me there. We will we'll not carry you anywhere. If you're a child of God, you remain as a child of God. Whatever will happen, God is in charge. And God is still on the throne. And your people, you know, my people said, my people said, who are your people? Where are your people? I said, where are your people? Ah, uh, where are your people? And then sometimes when you have a problem, my people, my people, forget about that. These are your people here. And then we pray. And if we pray according to the will of God, he said he will answer. If he has not answered, there is a reason. And if he has not answered and he said, I want to take him home, he owns you. You belong to him. And then he says, he's preparing a mansion for you. If you are going to die, die happy. Die holy. And die righteous. Rather than going under their talisman or their incantation. Then you die there. God forbid. Second Kings chapter 1. Second Kings chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 2. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in, the, in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go. 
and choir of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, the Tishbite, arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up and shall surely die. And Elijah departed. You see, he died under the anger and the fury and the rebuke of God. I pray you will not die like that. You see the people that are looking for this and looking for that, and they're not trusting God. And let's look at Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 19. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits. They say, this problem is too much. If only faith in Christ will not do it, this one is too much. If prayer cannot do it, this one is too much. If the ordinary prayer you are praying in your church, deeper life, you stick to the word, stick to the word. You don't know about territorial spirit. You don't know about bush spirit. You don't know about marine spirit. You don't know about the curse. You don't know about the yoke. You don't know about digging something out. You don't know this. You don't know that. If you cannot handle it where you are, why don't you come to us? And then we can handle it for you. How are you going to handle it? Beyond the Bible. Beyond the promises of God. And beyond the blood of Jesus Christ. Beyond the name of Jesus. They'll tell you. When they tell you to seek unto them that have familiar spirits. And unto wizards that peep and that mortar should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead. Look at verse 20 to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, tell me. Because there's, there's no light in them. If they do not speak according to this word, we're learning. That's because there's no truth in them. There's no light in them. There's no sound doctrine in them. Seeking help or seeking healing, seeking deliverance, seeking miracle, seeking guidance, seeking vision, seeking revelation, seeking protection, and seeking prayers from familiar spirits, from traditional healers, and from false prophets, from occultic sources, is sinful and condemned by God. You will not do that which is condemned by God. All who do it, sinners and backsliders alike, pagans or churchgoers, they come under God's wrath. And God's judgment. I pray that will not happen to you. Amen. Point number three now. The consequence of dying godless. The consequence of dying graceless. The consequence of dying without God. We're coming to First Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10. We're reading from verse 14. First Chronicles chapter 10, reading from verse 14. It tells us in verse 14 what actually happened, the judgment that came upon Saul. It says, and he inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned the kingdom Unto David, the son of Jesse. It tells us about this man. He forsook God. He forgot God. And because he forsook God and forgot God, see the verdict on his life. And see the destiny of the man who forsakes God. The man 
who forgets God. Psalm 9, I'm reading from verse 17. Psalm 9, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into, tell me, into hell. The wicked shall be turned into hell. The sinner shall be turned into hell. The backslider, unrepentant, impenitent, rebellious backslider that remains a backslider to the point of death. That backslider shall be turned into hell. And all the nations, tell me, all the people, tell me, all the backsliders tell me that forget God. You cannot go from praying in the name of Jesus and go into seeking healing with witchcraft without forgetting God. You cannot go from trusting, depending on the blood of the Lamb, the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, where we each were saved, and go to familiar spirit seeking deliverance, seeking healing and seeking power and seeking miracle you cannot forget the blood of the lamb and go to familiar spirit without forgetting god and it says the wicked the sinner the backslider the impenitent and all that forget god shall be turned into hell i said chapter 47 Isaiah chapter 47, I'm reading from verse 9. Isaiah 47, reading from verse 9. It tells us in verse 9, Isaiah 47, it tells us clearly, but these two things shall come to thee in a moment. In one day, the loss of children and widowhood they shall come upon thee in their fullness, in their perfection, their totality, entirety. For the multitude of thy, what? Sorceries. God condemns sorcery. And for the great abundance of thy enchantment. For thou wast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou wast said, non seers. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it has corrupted, perverted, defiled thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. Therefore shall evil come upon thee. And thou shalt not know from whence it rises. And mischief shall fall upon thee. And thou shalt not be able to put it off and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly which thou shalt not know stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries wherein thou hast labored from thy youth if so be thou shalt be able to profit if so be thou mayest prevail thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly progressionators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee behold they shall be a stumble and the fire shall burn them and they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm arch, nor fire to sage before each. Just telling us in short that those who delve into sorceries, into familiar spirit, and into all the occultism to get help, to get healing, to get miracle, to get signs and wonders, to get whatever, the judgment of God will come upon them. They will not get to the kingdom of God. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. It says in verse 20, Galatians chapter 5, 
idolatry, witchcraft. You see, that is New Testament, witchcraft. He treads various emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before. As I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, witchcraft, familiar spirit, sorceries, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 21. Reading from verse 8. But the fearful, I fear the people. But the fearful, I so fear the people, I cannot stand by the word of God. And I cannot stand by the conviction that God is almighty, that Jesus is Alpha and Omega. And whatever is beyond him, forget about it. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the warmongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which bonnet with fire and brimstone which is the second death remember the idolaters are there and the sorcerers are there revelation chapter 22 revelation chapter 22 i'm reading from verse 14 it says, blessed are they which do his commandments. Somebody there will do the commandments of the Lord. That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city for outside, without. Outside the kingdom of God, without. Outside heaven and outside heaven is hellfire. For without are dogs and what sorcerers and all mongers those are adulterers fornicators and murderers and idolaters idol worshippers occultic uh, powers and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie forgetting god in times of distress forgetting god in times of disease forgetting god in times of depression or discouragement has great eternal consequences forsaking God and finishing one's earthly race finishing one's earthly pilgrimage in the house of Dagon in the temple of Satan will usher that sinner that backslider into the abode of the damned forever and ever but you will not go that direction and yet, we need to sound this note of warning. First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 11 and verse 12. Now, all these things happened unto them. For examples, and they are reaching for our learning, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let's read it together. Verse 12, wherefore, let him that thinketh and standeth take heed lest he fall. Once again, wherefore, let him that thinketh and standeth take heed lest he fall. For the final time, wherefore, let him that thinketh and standeth take heed lest he fall. The Lord is calling us to abide in Christ, to abide in grace to abide in the gospel and to abide in God unbelief in that many people from entering to the land of promise unbelief hinders people from entering into heaven it was unbelief that made Saul to take all those steps and then to go to the witch and then to the familiar spirits anyone today if you have faith in god you're not going to be seeking after familiar spirit if you have unbelief that's what they do the people that have unbelief but unbelief will shut the door of heaven against you that you'll not be able to get to heaven i pray unbelief will not erode your life will not eat up your life 
Unbelief, unbelief happens in different ways. You're looking for something, you have not got it yet. Unbelief will drive you to the wrong direction. And then you want healing, you want miracle, and then oh, the opportunities are there for us uh, to pray together so that whatever challenges the Lord will take away. But unbelief, we do not prize what we have. We do not appreciate what we have. We do not exalt what we have. It's what is on the other side of the fence we're looking after. And then because of unbelief, we run over there. And then those who die in unbelief, you'll miss heaven forever. And if you miss heaven, you'll do more than cry it will be terrible i pray you'll not miss heaven now that you are not sick now that you're well now that you have ears to hear and might to understand now that you can say that's the word of god i believe that i accept that that's going to make your decision so that when the time of challenge will come by the grace of god you'll not fall away in jesus name Let's rise up and tell the Lord, this is not just the usual prayer. This is going to be definite, definite prayer that you make up your mind. You say, I'm not going to end up my life in a shrine, in a temple, in a synagogue of Satan. I'm going to seek the face of the Lord. And I'm going to make up my mind today and take a decision. Let not the fear of man or the fear of a woman, or the fear of a group of people in the you, take your stand and say, when I came to know the Lord, I didn't know all these people, I'll not be afraid of anyone or anything, I'm going to serve the Lord faithfully with conviction until I die. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord.